Hello everyone, welcome to webinar series by Edureka. So today we are going to talk about the Selenium interview preparation. Whenever you go for interviews, there are certain questions related to Selenium for which the answers are pretty confusing. So today we are going to talk about such questions and give a clear guidelines of what the answers can be. Okay, before that let me introduce myself. My name is Sanket and I have around 10 plus years of experience as a tester. So of which 8 plus years is purely into automation testing. So based on my experience, I'll answer these questions and we'll walk you through what are the details. So the first question is explain the different exceptions in Selenium web driver. So whenever you, a Selenium web driver is a script written in different programming languages. You can use Java, Ruby, Perl, Python, PHP, JavaScript, etc. to write your Selenium scripts. So these scripts, might throw exception at a certain point of time when the application does not behave as per your expectation. So few of the exceptions are listed below. The first one is timeout exception. So timeout exception is thrown when the command does not complete in enough time. So for instance, you tell your Selenium web driver script, okay, 30 seconds is the maximum time for which you can wait before you move ahead or before you throw an exception. And the command, it does not complete in 30 seconds. So you will receive a timeout exception on your console. No such element exception. So no such element exception is related to your uh, Selenium web driver trying to find the element on the loaded screen. So this exception is thrown when the element with given attribute is not found. What Selenium does is it tries to go to the page source code and tries to matches your particular attribute. For instance, I say X path is equal to X, Y, Z. So it will go through the source code, try to find out, okay, is there an element with X path as X, Y, Z? And it doesn't find it. So it will throw no such element exception. That means the element is not present in the document object model of that particular page. Element not visible exception. So element not visible exception is thrown when the element is a part of the DOM, that is the document object model, but it is not visible. That means it will not be available on the screen, though it is present in the DOM. Stale element exception. So this is a very commonly thrown exception with web pages. So thrown when element is deleted or is no longer attached to the DOM. So if the element that you are trying to search has been deleted or is no longer the part of document object model of the currently loaded page, then Selenium would throw a stale element exception, okay? Then the second question is, what is exception test in Selenium web driver? So whenever you run a test, you expect an exception to be thrown. You have written a test in a way that it should throw an exception. By the way, this is a part of your negative testing strategy. So what we do is, the at the rate test annotation, it has a parameter that is expected exception and you can name the exception that you are expecting. For instance, I say I run a test and I know that element which I'm trying to find is not available on the currently loaded page. So you expect that it should throw a no such element exception. So the format is at the rate test expected exception is equal to no such element exception dot class. So whatever exception you expect over here, you should append dot class after that. So that's the standard format and the way in which the exception is to be stated. Okay. So the next question is, have you used Excel sheet in your project? So this is a very common question that people would like to ask and people would like to drill down on the Excel sheets part. So as to how you use, uh, used it, did you use it for data sets, did you use it for providing information while starting your test, like for instance the application URL, then the username, the password, in what way did you use it? People would be interested to know and also people would like to know if it was dynamic, the coding was dynamic, that is no hard codings, the for loops would run as many number of times, there is data in the data sheet and so on. Excel sheet is used as a data source for test and also contains data set for data driven testing. So these are the two basic uses of Excel sheet. When you use it as a data source, so what can be the part of the Excel sheet? It can be the application URL for all environments. That is, you state all the application URL. For example, you have different environments. You have the development environment, the testing environment, staging, pre-production, production where you want to perform the test. I want to perform the test on testing environment. So 
At such time, I have to state the application URL on which the test should begin. So I keep all the application URLs in my Excel sheet and only point out through my code that, okay, I want to use the staging URL. I want to use the QA environment URL. So all the application URLs can be part of data source, but you can use one particular URL. Then your username and password for different environments. Each environment will be associated with a different username and a different password. So this is case wherein, you know, the security is specifically concerned. So you can use it to store your usernames and passwords in a encoded format. It's a very good practice to put your usernames and password in encoded format in Excel sheets. Keeping open passwords is vulnerable to security risks. So just encode your password, put it in the Excel sheet, your framework or wherever you are calling your passwords, you can decode the password over there before sending it to the text box on your application. Test cases to be executed. So this is a very peculiar use of Excel sheets. That is what tests you want to execute. For instance, I have 200 test cases, but for a particular release or for a particular type of test, I don't require all of them. I just want to state which test cases are to be executed. So you can keep column. That is the name of the test case and whether you want to execute it or no, maybe in yes and no format. So whatever test cases are associated or have a yes, in front of them only those test cases will get executed rest will be skipped so these are the three major uses of excel sheet when it is used as a data source if you use it as a data set for data driven test then you have data for your different iterations to be performed on application for instance i have a page wherein i want to check you know by putting in the different combinations of different fields for example first name last name email and I want to perform UI validations as well. So what I will do is for each iteration, I'll have a particular data set in which one of the field is invalid and I expect my application should not allow me to move to the next page, right? And when I put in all the data sets correctly, only then it should be able to move to next page. So all these data, they can be kept in Excel sheet as a data set for your data driven test and your code is going to execute each row of this as one data set, put it onto your application and then run your test case. So your functional flow is the same. Your data for each iteration differs. So that's the particular use of using it for data driven testing. Okay. So moving on to next question, how can you redirect browsing from a browser through some proxy? So if I want to set a proxy for my browser from where it should access the particular application URL. So is it possible using Selenium WebDriver? Yes, it is possible. How does Selenium provide this facility? Selenium has a proxy class to redirect browsing from a proxy. That is, I can set while opening the browser itself that, okay, this browser will be communicating through a certain proxy and this proxy is the one which carries out the external communication. So string, I'll just explain you how you can set a proxy for particular application. So for this, you need to take help of the proxy class. So first of all, I declare a string called proxy and state what hub I want to use in terms of the host name or the IP address. So over here, I have taken the IP address that is 199.201.125.147 and the port on which the communication needs to be carried out is 8080. So now using the proxy class, so org.openqa.selenium.proxy. Okay, so I'm creating an object of proxy class. Proxy is equal to new proxy. Then I will set the HTTP proxy, the FTP proxy and the SSL proxy using proxy dot set HTTP proxy to the value that we have taken as string over here, FTP proxy to the same SSL proxy to the same. So you can also set different proxies over here. Like if you want the HTTP proxy to go through 199.201, the HTTP proxy can be mentioned here. If you want some other FTP proxy, just declare one more string and put it over here. And so is the case with SSL proxy. Then what next? What we have to do now is we have to make use of the desired capabilities. So desired capabilities is one of the methods provided by Selenium. 
so that you can start the browser with your own capabilities. That is whatever parameters you want to set before invoking the particular browser. So desired capabilities creating an object of that using desired capabilities cap is equal to new desired capabilities. Then what I need to do is I need to pass on this object of proxy that I have created so that it will be able to start my browser and the browser will behave as if it is communicating through 199.201.125.147. So I say cap dot set capability and pass on the capability type dot proxy. That means which capability I want to set is the proxy and pass on the object of proxy over here. If you see the object of proxy created, then we have set the HTTP proxy, FTP proxy and the SSL proxy and we are just passing that object. So now capabilities has all the required information for starting my browser. Then I say web driver driver is equal to new Firefox driver with the desired capabilities cap. So now whenever my browser invokes it knows it has to communicate through one of the proxies and hence behave as if it is a page on that particular proxy that is 199.201.125.147. Okay next. So this one is a very important question being frequently asked but most of the time the answer is not found up to mark by the interviewers. So let's see what exactly is a page object model and what are the advantages of page object model. So as you all know that page object model it's a design pattern to create object repository for web UI elements. What we want to do is we want to separate the page methods from the page objects. Why? Because the page objects they can be utilized by multiple tests and we don't want to create the objects in that test itself because what will happen is ultimately you would be creating web elements for the same objects into multiple test cases and if one of the object changes you will have to make changes at multiple places. So we don't want to give multiple points of failure. What we want is there should be a single point of failure. If the web element has changed, if the web element does not exist, if there is something happened to the web element, it has moved to a different place because of which the XPath is not being identified or any such sort of thing. So it should be done only at one place. That is the object repository for the page which we are creating. Okay. So what we do in page object model, separate the objects from the methods. So page object model is a design pattern to create object repositories for web UI elements. Then each web page in the application should have corresponding page class. So what we try to do is each of the web page of the application should have a class in the code. That means we can create objects in that class and then those objects can be utilized by any of the test which needs that object. Page class will find the web elements of that web page and also contain page methods which will perform operations on those web elements. So page class will contain the page objects and the page methods will be able to perform operations on these page objects. What are the advantages of POM that is a page object model? Keep operations and flows in UI separate from a verification. So we want to keep the objects and the operations separate from the verification. So wherever we are trying to perform a verification, we don't want the methods to exist over there. We don't want the objects to exist over there. So basically for a particular functionality, you come up with three classes. One class for the objects purely, one class for the methods, those are being performed onto that particular objects. And the third class where you actually write your at the rate test or uh, your test case and it goes to execute a method, the method utilizes the objects and it just returns what it has found on the screen and then the verification is done in the class where you have written your test. So over there if you see the test case, test case will be very simple, it will be very readable and it will be more useful rather than creating all these three things at one place. Object repository independent of test cases. So what we want to do is for instance I have one page for which I am writing 10 different test cases. I don't want to create the objects 10 times. What I want to do is create the object once, write the code for the object once and let all these classes which want the objects on the same page come to the object repository, pick up the object of its choice, 
do this operation and just get back the results. And this also encourages extreme code reusability. So whatever code you have written that will be utilized by different classes and hence you can achieve more code reusability. Okay, then what is a page factory? So page object model was a concept wherein you have to manually create all these three classes and then work with these three classes. So page factory came into picture at a later point of time with one of the Selenium releases and page factory gave you optimized way of implementing page object model. Okay, so it implements page object model but in a very optimized way. Page factory is an inbuilt page object model concept for Selenium web driver which is very optimized. So optimized in the sense the memory utilization is very good. Also the implementation is done in completely object oriented manner. Separation of page object repository and test methods. So this is what we want to achieve that is just separate out the page objects from the test methods so that multiple test methods can reutilize the same object repository. Page factory class provides at the rate find by annotation to find web elements. So now I don't have to use the driver.find elements method. It provides its own annotation known as at the rate find by method and find by can accept tag name, partial link text, name, link text, ID, CSS, class name and XPath as attributes. So all the major locators of Selenium are supported by at the rate find by annotation. So you can find any of the elements with the help of tag name, partial link text, name, link text, ID, CSS, class name and XPath attributes. Okay. The next question is what are the different types of wait statements in Selenium web driver? So Selenium WebDriver provides very powerful synchronization techniques by which you can synchronize the speed of execution of a WebDriver script with the application under test. Because what happens is the application under test has certain kind of latency like it has to serve requests from multiple users or multiple clients. So it's going to respond one by one, one by one, one by one. So my request goes there and it takes a few milliseconds or seconds for the server to respond back. But Selenium web driver wouldn't have known that, that okay, there is some latency from the server side because server is uh, serving too many requests at this time. So Selenium web driver would say, okay, this is my line of code. It would convert it into the command for browser to execute. And it would say, okay, this is my next command. But as the page hasn't changed, the server hasn't responded. So the application is not yet ready to deal with the next command sent by Selenium web driver. So what we need to do is we need to synchronize web driver with the application. That is we need to maintain the speed consistency. That is Selenium web driver should slow down a little bit and you know adjust according to how the application server is responding back. So to do this, we have weights in Selenium web driver. So there are two major weights that is implicit weight and explicit weight. So let us discuss these weights in detail and how do they achieve synchronization for us. So the first one is implicit weight. It instructs web driver to wait for some time by polling the DOM. So what it does is for instance I declare a wait of 30 seconds. So it will pull the document object model periodically for the element. For instance, my command is driver.find element by xpath xyz. So it first of all, when you come to this line of code where you want to find the element, it will go. It will try to find that object in the DOM. It says, the, okay, the object not exist at this particular point of time. So what it does is it waits for some amount of time and again pulls the DOM. Say if the wait interval is 30 seconds. It comes back after 3 seconds and again pulls the DOM. So now it is still not able to find the object. What it does is it waits for 3 more seconds. Again pulls the DOM. So now at this time when the 6 seconds have elapsed, it is able to find the object. What it does is after the object is found, it will just move on to the next step and discard the remaining 24 seconds. So this will help you to write scripts which have flexibility to wait for the application in case the application requires more or less time. That is if it finds the object at 0 second, it won't wait even for 1 second. It will just move on to the next line of code, Selenium WebDriver. But if there is some kind of latency, the server is serving multiple requests, 
and server so requires some time to respond back. So it will also allow that time. So your script execution will be flexible to accommodate any kind of latency from the application side. So once you have declared implicit wait, it will be available for entire life of web driver instance. So implicit wait it is declared upon the instance of web driver. So as soon as I say web driver driver is equal to new Chrome driver, the next line I can write that driver dot manage dot timeout implicitly wait for so and so number of seconds. That is maximum number of seconds before throwing an exception. So maybe I give this value to be equal to 30 seconds. So 30 seconds become the maximum time for which Selenium web driver will wait to hear back from your application or hear back from the code before throwing any kind of exception. By default the value of implicit wait is zero. So if you don't state any timeout that means though you have declared an implicit wait by default it will just act as no wait because the default value is zero. So you need to change this default value you need to provide a particular value so that your Selenium web driver would wait for that certain amount of time. So with the today's world application 10 seconds to 30 seconds is a very good timeout for implicit wait because you can expect your results or your answer from the server within 30 seconds. If you set a longer default then behavior will pull the DOM on periodic basis depending upon the browser driver implementation. So whatever timeout you set, the polling of the DOM depends upon the browser and the driver implementation. So that means that the period of polling Firefox browser for a particular element can or may differ from the period for Chrome browser. Because both of them, they use different drivers. Like, you know, with Selenium 3.0, Firefox uses Gecko driver, whereas Chrome uses Chrome driver itself. So it depends upon the implementation of the driver as well. The next type of weight is a explicit weight. So explicit weight is kind of smarter weight which can be put upon a particular element. That is I don't want my whole script or you know the weight to be implemented at each and every line of code. What I want is I know that a particular element is a bit late. A particular element requires some time because there is a processing involved from the server side. So I can put an explicit weight on a particular element. An explicit wait instructs the execution to wait for some time until some condition is achieved. So there are different conditions for which you can put an explicit wait. The first one being element to be clickable. So the condition can be wait till the element is clickable but wait only for you know say 30 seconds which is the maximum timeout. So explicit wait also behaves in the same uh, manner as I explained for implicit wait that is it would pull the DOM periodically, it will see if the condition is achieved. But the major difference is implicit weight is for all lines of code, explicit weight is a condition put on a particular element. So the second condition can be element to be selected. So an element though present on the screen may not be available for selection until a particular processing is done. So in such conditions element to be selected can be used presence of element located. So you can also check for the presence of element which is located by a particular attribute. For instance, I can locate the element with any of the attributes like ID, name, CSS, XPath, anything of that sort. Okay. So the next question with respect to the Selenium web driver weights, that is write a code to wait for a particular element to be visible on page. So just as we talked about the explicit weight, we want a condition to be fulfilled before you move on to the next line of code. So what we will do is first of all how are explicit weights defined. So there is a particular way in which explicit may need to be defined. You need to define a web driver weight first. So a web driver weight it's a class for which I'm creating an object okay and I declare it for 20 seconds and this web driver weight it requires the instance of the web driver that is driver to be passed along with the timeout. So the first parameter is the instance of the web driver that is driver in this case and 20 is the number of seconds it should wait. So the time unit over here is seconds in web driver wait class. Then I say element. So this is a web element for which I'm trying to wait. Element is equal to wait. I'm using this object wait until. So until is a method which will decide till what point of time the web driver should wait expected conditions dot visibility of the element located by xpath is available on screen. So what this does is it will first of all wait until the expected condition that is 
an element to be visible on the screen which is located by the X path. So over here you can give whatever X path you want for that element and once this element is visible what it does is it stores it in a variable of type web element which we have named as element. So once this is available it gets stored into element. The next question is write a code to wait for an alert to appear. So you can also wait till an expected condition that is presence of an alert. So this is written in the same manner that is the web driver wait for 20 seconds I'm declaring along with the instance of the web driver and then I say element that is the alert will be wait until expected condition dot alert is present. So I'll be waiting till the alert is present on the screen. Okay, let's go to the next question. The next is what is the use of JavaScript executor? So as you guys have heard, you know, there's something known as JavaScript executor. What exactly it is? So JavaScript executor, it is used to provide Selenium web driver capabilities beyond what Selenium web driver can do with its inbuilt methods. So there are certain operations which we perform manually, which we feel are very easy, but they don't have a direct method with Selenium web driver. So what Selenium web driver did is, as JavaScript is language for writing the front end, so JavaScript is pretty much able to perform anything onto the screen. So Selenium, it gave a JavaScript executor class into which you can write any of the JavaScript. What Selenium will do is, it will call the browser's JavaScript executor, ask it to execute this particular JavaScript, which it has no idea what it needs to do. The JavaScript will go to the browser's JavaScript executor. It will execute and return back something if asked to Selenium web driver. So Selenium can perform those operations which are beyond its capability with the help of JavaScript executor. So JavaScript executor is an interface which provides a mechanism to execute JavaScript through Selenium web driver. It provides execute script and execute async script that is asynchronous script methods to run JavaScript in context of the currently selected frame or window. So it knows the context will be whatever is currently selected. So it will just execute that JavaScript through Selenium web driver using one of the two methods that is execute script or execute asynchronous script to run JavaScript in context of currently selected frame or window. So whatever page, window, tab, frame you were working with, the JavaScript will get executed over the same window or same frame. And what is the syntax of JavaScript executor? It's pretty much simple. We just need to declare the object of JavaScript executor. JS is equal to JavaScript executor and driver. And JS.execute script, you need to pass on the script and if any arguments required. So this specific part that is script and arguments would specifically belong to JavaScript. If you are not very familiar with JavaScript, you might need help of a JavaScript expert who can give you a script for performing a certain or a particular operation. Okay, the next one, how to scroll down a page using JavaScript in Selenium, how to scroll down to a particular element. So now we will be talking in the context of how can I scroll down on the page with the help of JavaScript executor. So my need is I need to scroll from the top of the page to the bottom of the page or to a particular position on the page. So I can do that both with the help of JavaScript executor. So syntax being very simple, JavaScript executor driver. So instead of declaring an object of JavaScript executor, we, we can directly use it. So I've used it directly dot execute script. So this is one of the methods for execution of JavaScript window dot scroll by so what I say is I want to scroll from 0 to 500 position okay so uh, what the script will do is basically scroll down from the 0th position to the 500 position the second question is how to scroll down to a particular element now I want to scroll down till I'm able to view the particular element in the frame of my view that is it's available on the screen and visible to the user so for doing this, I can use the JavaScript executor, that is JavaScript executor driver dot execute script, arguments zero. So any kind of arguments that you want to pass dot scroll into view. So I want to scroll in to view particular element. And this element over here 
is a web element which has already been created with help of any one of its attribute like I say web element element is equal to driver dot find element by xpath as ABC and that is stored in this so you need to pass the web element so that JavaScript knows till the visibility of which element I should scroll down or I should scroll up okay so it will just try to locate that particular element on the screen and then scroll accordingly so that the element is in the frame of view for the user okay so the next question is how to handle keyboard and mouse actions using selenium so selenium it provides a way by which you can imitate the mouse and keyboard actions onto the screen through your script so what these actions can be like if i have a drag and drop operation that is i want to drag a element from its source to its target so what i perform is i go to the source element I click and hold the left button of my mouse then move my mouse to the target element and then release the click right so this would have been very difficult to code without the actions class in selenium actions class it provides solution for performing all such operations which are you know very specific to user action imitation so what does actions class provide handling special keyboard and mouse events are done using the advanced user interactions api it contains the actions and the action classes so there are basically two classes one is called as the actions and one is called as the action class that are needed for executing these events so basically all the complex things you can just hand over to actions class like for instance I want to type in something in uppercase so I might have to hit either the caps lock key or I might have to press and hold the shift key and then type in whatever I want to get in uppercase and then release the shift key so this is again a complex operation which can be easily achieved with the help of action class so actions class it is going to provide you methods to perform such complex keyboard and mouse operations let's see a few of them the method is click and hold so click and hold just like I told you if you want to move some element on the screen so you would like to click and hold the left mouse button move it to target so click and hold is a method directly provided by the actions class which will click without releasing at the current mouse location whatever is the current mouse location it will just click and hold the click and it will allow you to move it to some different location then release it release it at the same location do any kind of action or operation with it drag and drop so drag and drop it's an ill-built method which will pick up the element from its source location or drag it all the way to its target and release it onto the target so this method is used for especially like you know you have columns you have a result grid for which you can select your own columns so and these columns are configurable so you have a list of available columns on the left and you have a list of selected columns on the right and to make any columns visible on the screen you need to drag it from the available list and drop it into the selected list so over there you can use the drag and drop functionality through actions class to just select a column from the left in the availables and drop it to the selected columns on the right so that it is available within your result grid so the next is source target to the location of the target element then release the mouse so this can be used in combination with click and hold wherein you know that okay this is the source and this is the target so you can go to the location of the target element and then release the click okay so actions class will provide you the method to interact with the application in the way you interact with your keyboard and mouse okay the next question is how to send alt shift control keys in selenium web driver so what i want to do is i want to use this special keys not only alt control shift i may also have to use the function keys so how can i send these function keys so that i'm able to perform my action so the action class it provides certain methods which will help you perform this operations so the first one is the key down method so key down method accepts modifier key as the parameter so any one out of these three like the alt shift control for instance I want to uh, you know press 
control shift delete with the help of my selenium script so i can use the actions class i can use the key down method i can you know key down alt then the next line of code i can key down shift and the next line of code i can key down delete so all these three keys i want to just press in combination so i can use the key down method so it will be able to perform the same complex operations that you perform with your keyboard so for the key down method the parameter is the modifier key that is keys dot alt or keys dot shift or keys dot control purpose is to perform a modifier key press doesn't release the modifier key subsequent interactions may assume it's kept press for instance i select modifier key to be equal to shift in this case so i say key down keys dot shift then i say that okay i want to type in my own name that is s a n k e t so what it will do is it will assume that the shift key is pressed and each of this alphabets s a n k e t it will be typed in to uppercase letters why because i have just used the key down method i didn't use the key up method so key up method is performing the reverse operation of key down and can only be used after a key down method so i have pressed shift i have entered some text all goes into uppercase letters and when i say key up then the key will be released and you can resume your normal operations so over here the modifier keys is keys dot alt or keys dot shift or keys dot control and the perform it performs a key release operation okay so let us see a small example of how this works so i have a script into which i am going to a particular text box that is the email id text box and i want to type in my you know my email id it's all case sensitive and i would like to enter it in the same manner so what i do is i declare an object of actions that is builder is equal to new actions and pass on the instance of web driver so that it perform it knows where exactly my web driver is on which page which frame whatever it is then action series of action so the next class that i have used is the action class and i declare an object known as series of actions and i say builder which is an object of the actions class dot move to element txt username so i'm going to the email id field and i perform a click operation so that my cursor is blinking in the username field then i say key down shift keys dot shift so text username onto this text box i say keys dot shift that means whatever is typed after this it will be typed in upper case next what i do is i use the send keys method and send text as hello so my output will be hello in upper case why because my shift key is pressed then what i do is dot key up and i just release the shift key so anything after this will again go to lower case only hello which i entered in the username field it will be in upper case because it was done when the shift key was pressed and then i perform the subsequent series of action okay then how to take screenshots in selenium web driver so this is a very important question because uh, you know screenshot is kept as a proof for the client that okay the code works as intended whether it is in case of failure whether it's case of success that exactly what happened that's the mirror for instance if it was successful yesterday i capture a screenshot and the next day it failed so the client would say did you test it yesterday i would say yes definitely they would say do you have any proof that you tested it yesterday yes this is a screenshot your application was up and running so this is my test that was performed it got the screenshot at this particular stage of the operations and here it is similarly if you want to say okay the server is down the client says no no from my side the server is up your automation scripts run they get a screenshot of the failure that is something might be displayed on the screen the application is not responding or something like this so you just capture it and you send it across to the client that okay see your application is not up from your end and hence this is the proof so screenshot would serve as the best proof in any case success or failure so keeping screenshots is a good practice and let's see how to capture the screenshot so getting screenshot is done through an object of file class so what we want to do is basically first of all we want to get the screenshot of the web browser whatever state the application is we want to store it in a temporary file 
and then this is in the Java heap memory now and we want to transfer this file to our file system so that it can be kept forever because whatever is stored in the Java heap memory that will vanish once the program execution stops because Java's garbage collector it will clean off everything how we do it is if you see web driver driver is equal to new Firefox driver that is I'll be using Firefox browser for performing my test then driver.get google.com I'm just navigating to google.com now I create an object of the file class so I say file src file is equal to take screenshot of the current state of the driver so take screenshot is a method defined within selenium web driver which is capable of getting the current state of the driver so it gets the current state of the driver as a picture then what I do with this picture is I say get screenshot as output type dot file so I got the picture but what to do with this picture I will have to store it as a file of type output that is the file which can be exported from Java heap memory to the external file system so I say take screenshot of the driver dot get screenshot as output type file now where the screenshot got stored right now it got stored in an object of file called as src file now I have this src file in the Java heap memory and I should move it to my file system so what I do for that is I use the file utils so file utils is a class which will help you perform certain operations with the files so file utils dot copy file copy the src file this is the source file to a new file in your file system at d colon and you name that file so you save screen dot png so now this src file gets copied from the java heap memory into your file system at this particular location with name as save screen and extension as dot png so it is very important that you give the extension as well while you're trying to save the file because that's going to define how that file is going to open because for Java it's just a file it doesn't know what type of file it is what it is going to do with that file what should be the output format so that it is available to the external user from his file system it doesn't know anything about that so that's the reason the file utils it will perform the operation okay I got a raw file from Java I need to store it as a PNG file so file utils will do that work next question how to set the size of browser window using selenium so most of the times you would prefer to run your test either in maximize mode if you're using it on a remote system you would like to run it in minimize mode if you are using your own system and you also want to work but sometimes it might be important to check how the application behaves in a particular size as well particular window size as well so for these type of testing you will have to set the window size and then work with your application so first of all let us see how you can set the window size to maximum so that's pretty simple there's an inbuilt method from selenium inside the driver dot manage dot window dot maximize so this maximize method it will put your browser window to the maximum width as your screen so if your resolution is 1980 into 1240 so it will just maximize it to that particular resolution if your resolution is something else it will cater to that resolution but the basic functionality it will perform is maximize your browser window to fit to your screen but what if I want to set it to a particular size so to set it to a particular size what I'll do is first of all I will have to know what size I want to set my window to so what I do is system dot out dot print ln I'll say driver dot manage dot window dot get size so window dot get size is a method which will tell you what is the current size of the window okay this can be useful to know okay for instance I got a screenshot and I want to also attach that the screen what was the window size at that point of time so it will get you the size now I want to set a new dimension for my window a new size for my window so what I say is I take help of the dimension class so I create an object of dimension D is equal to new dimension and pass on the dimensions that is I want it to be 420 by 600 so that's the X and Y coordinate so 420 on the X coordinate and 600 on the Y coordinate so basically this is a kind of vertical window not a horizontal window because its Y coordinate is greater than its X coordinate then driver dot manage dot window dot set size so set size is a method which will allow you to resize your window 
to the given dimensions. So I pass on the object of dimension that I have created. That is now my window size will be 420 by 600. This will resize to the given dimensions. Okay. I can also use JavaScript executor to do the same. So what I do is I say JavaScript executor driver dot execute script window dot resize. So within JavaScript there's a very simple function to resize your window and that's window dot resize to and I just pass on the dimensions that is I want it to be 1024 into 768. So this is a horizontal window wherein the X coordinate is greater than the Y coordinate. The next question. How to handle a drop down in Selenium web driver? How to select a value from the drop down? So what I want to do is I want to handle a particular drop down. If you see on the left hand side, the code for the drop down is provided. That is select ID is equal to my select and option has certain parameters. The first parameter is value. That is option one. The visible text as France. Okay, France, at least Spain and all these are coded as option 1, option 2 and option 3. So if you see over here, the important condition to use the select class for Selenium web driver is that the HTML tag for the element should be select. That is over here without the select tag, you cannot use this method that is select by visible text, select by index or select by value. So just be sure that whatever element you're using, it should have the select tag. So what I can do is web element my select element so this is the element for the drop down i say driver dot find element by ideas my select so uh, first of all i'll have to select the particular drop down and then only i can go into the options that are available for the drop down i cannot directly access the options then select drop down is equal to new select as my select element so this is the code just for selecting that drop down to work with or i can directly say select drop down is equal to new select driver dot find element by id as my select so now within this drop down option i have my drop down for which there are different options available so you can select the value using three different methods the first one is select by visible text so whatever is visible to the user you can select the particular option by that text itself so if i say select by visible text i should be writing in something from france italy and spain because that's the visible text to the user. So I can say select by visible text as Italy. I can also do a select by index. So select by index would, you know, get the option index or index your options from zero to N minus one. So for me, option one is at index zero, option two is at index one, and option three is at index two. So when I say drop down dot select by index two, what will get selected from the drop down is Spain. Okay, do remember that the indexing it always starts from zero and not from one. And the third option is drop down dot select by value. So over here, I want to select by value as option three. So what is the value over here? Option three is for Spain. So as a user, I'll be still able to see Spain in the drop down as selected value. So three methods, but very important condition that is the HTML tag should have select without the select tag. You cannot use any of these methods. That's an important catch for this question. Do remember. The next is how to switch to a new window. That is a new tab, which opens up after you click on a link. So if I click on a link and a new window or a new tab is open, then I want to switch the reference of my web driver from the existing window to the newly opened window and perform operations on the newly opened window because without shifting the reference of web driver from the current window to the newly opened window you won't be able to find the elements on the new window because web driver is still on the old window and will try to find the elements of the new window which you have provided attributes onto the old window itself so it is very important that you switch from the current window to the newly opened window and to do this, Selenium has provided an inbuilt method. So you can use the driver dot switch to dot window. That is, if you want to switch to a new window using the window name. So I can pass the window name, whatever the window name is. I can say, okay, x driver dot switch to window x y z, and it would find the window name and just shift to that window. You may also have to switch to the frame. So the same command that is driver dot switch to 
but dot frame because you want to switch to a frame inside the same page is used to switch to a frame using the name of frame and the third one is driver dot switch to alert so if there is any kind of alert which is asking you to accept it or dismiss it you need to first go to that alert and only then you can accept or dismiss it so we'll be writing driver dot switch to alert but there is a problem when the window does not have a name so it is a common problem that uh, you know whatever new window is open the window does not have a name the window does not have an id so how will you identify that window so there is a method called as get window handle so get window handle what it will do is it will return you the handle of the current window and the command is get windows handle so get windows handle will return you handle of all the currently open window but only opened by the selenium code not by any other instance of selenium or done by the user no you won't be getting handles of those windows the only window handles returned by this command will be for the current session opened by selenium web driver so what you can do is string handle is equal to driver dot get window handle and for string handle that is I'm using an enhanced for loop over the handles and just traversing to the handle and saying driver dot switch to dot window handle that is whatever is the current value of the handle just switch to that window and this is how even if the name is not present you can still be navigating to the newly opened window okay so the next question is how can you fetch an attribute from an element and how to retrieve the text from a text box so this is a common question that if I want to fetch the value of any attribute from the web element can I do it yes you can do it using the inbuilt method from selenium web driver and the method is get attribute so using get attribute you need to pass a parameter which is the name of the attribute and selenium web driver will return you the value for that particular attribute so let's take an example that I have web element which is the login text box so I say web element e login is equal to driver dot find element by name as login so my web element is stored in e login now and I say that I want to get the attribute class name for this particular element so I say e login dot get attribute and pass the parameter as class name so the get attribute method is going to return me a string value so I should capture that string value so that I can utilize it for further validations and verifications so what I just do is I say string login class name is equal to e login dot get attribute class name so whatever class name is returned by get attribute method it gets stored in login class name now the next question how to retrieve type text from a text box so similar to get attribute method we have a get text method which will specifically get the text for that particular web element so we have created a web element that is e login with its name as login and I say login e login dot get text so when I say e login dot get text it is going to return me a string value which I want to store for my further verifications and hence I store it in a string and say string login text is equal to login dot get text next how to upload a file using selenium web driver so file upload is a very common scenario with the modern age applications wherein you have to perform multiple types of verifications and validations on the file like you might have to check that only valid file formats the user should be able to upload only valid file formats uh, you might have to check that okay once the file is uploaded is the file successfully passed or is there any kind of error that is being thrown by the application so all these permutations and combinations can be verified directly with the help of selenium web driver so whenever you want to upload a file using selenium web driver there is a precondition attached that is for the web element which you know for instance you have a choose file button onto your UI so the element corresponding to choose file it should have HTML tag as input and the type as file so these two are important conditions which you will have to check before you can upload the file using the direct method provided by selenium web driver so what you can do is you can upload the file just by using the send keys method so you can say element is equal to driver dot find element by id upload file and element dot send keys just pass on the exact location of the file along with the file name so for instance i have kept it in my c drive so i say c colon 
myfile.txt. So the location, the file name along with its extension. So when you send this, Selenium can directly pick up that file from your file system and upload it to your application server. Next, how can we enter text without using the send keys method? Whether it is possible to enter text without send keys? The answer to this question is yes. You can enter text by using JavaScript executor, which we have already seen in the previous questions. And how to do that? JavaScript executor JSE, that is an object of JavaScript executor, and also providing it the instance of the web driver. So JSE.execute script document dot get element by ID as login dot value is equal to test text without send keys. So what I basically do over here is I go to the particular document using the DOM method of identification of the element and then I get the element by its ID as login and dot value. So I just impose this value over there so that it is available as the visible text to the user. So I'll just impose this value and it will be available in the text box. So you can enter text without send keys method using JavaScript executor. Next, explain how will you log in into any site if it is showing any authentication pop-up for password and username. There are certain sites wherein you know you browse, browse, browse and suddenly what happens is you want to perform certain operation. So at that, it did not ask you for login before you were trying to perform so many operations. But when, you know, a particular operation, for instance, uh, you are going through any of uh, the sites which uh, show rental properties. And you browse through the different uh, rental properties, but one property you find it to be very interesting and you just click, okay, show me the owner details. The moment you click show me owner details, it shows up a pop-up that you first need to log in, you need to register or do some sort of verification of your mobile and that's shown in a pop-up. So how do you handle such situations when the fields, username, password, they are being displayed in a pop-up? So to do so, we will be first of all using the explicit wait wherein we specify the condition that alert is present. That is, we want to verify that yes, the alert is definitely present and only if the alert is present, I want to just pass on the values of my username and password so that I can, you know, log into the site and continue performing my operations. So web driver wait, wait is equal to new web driver wait of 10 seconds. Alert is equal to wait, we are using the alert class so that we are able to check that the alert is being presented. Alert is equal to wait until expected conditions, alert is present, that is pop-up is being displayed. Then alert dot authenticate using new user and password. So I have defined the username and password. So what I'll do is I'll just pass on the values of username and password from here, which will be entered in, into the text fields of that pop-up bin display. Okay. The next is explain how you can find broken links in a page using Selenium. So this is a very tricky question, which the interviewer may ask that, okay, you are given a page and there are 20 links on the page, you need to find out which of the links is working and which of the links is not working. So what is the way how you can approach this question? So it's like if you go through all the hrefs on your page, they are always associated to the anchor HTML tag that is denoted by A. So first of all, what you can do is you can get all the anchor tags from your page source code then you need to get the value of each and every href. So what I'll do is I'll create a set of all the anchor tags. Then I'll get the value of href for all the anchor tags. Once I have the value of all the hrefs for anchor tag, that means I know the URL where it is hitting. Then using Java methods, what I'll do is I'll send a HTTP request to each of the href on the page. And whenever the link is correct, so what it will do is once I call that link using the get method, it will return me a status as 200 OK. So 200 OK denotes that, okay, yes, everything is fine. So if you have any other status than 200 OK, that means there is something wrong with that link. So you can segregate the links which have 200 OK to be the link is correct and navigating to the page, whereas the links which get status other than 200 
are cat can be categorized as broken links. So this is how you can approach this question and just get all the links which are working and links which are not working. Next, which techniques should you consider using throughout the script if there is neither frame ID nor frame name? So there are certain times when there are frames on page but none of the frames have name attached or ID attached to it. So how can you decide that okay I want to switch to this frame. It would be pretty difficult without having any kind of identification. But you don't need to worry because even if the frame ID or frame name is not available you can still switch to the frame using the frame index. And how does the indexing start? If you just go through the source code of the page, the first frame tag will have index 0, the second frame tag will have index 1, the third frame tag will have index 2. So that means if you start scrolling your page source from top to bottom, wherever you find HTML frame tag, you can just start indexing it from 0. So for instance, the frame tag I want to go to comes at second position in the page source code. What I can do is just say switch to frame 1. That means it will switch to the exact frame where you want to find the next elements. Next, what is the significance of test ng.xml file? So all of you while using Selenium WebDriver must have used test ng. So test ng is a framework which provides better annotations. It gives you better way of utilizing your code. It gives you certain facilities above JUnit so that the tester's life it becomes easy. So what exactly is a testng.xml file? So for executing your test cases in a suite, that is a group of test cases, you'll have to create a testng.xml file which contains the name of all the classes or methods which you want to execute as a part of that particular execution flow. So a test suite is a collection of test cases defined in the testng.xml file. In testng, we cannot define a suite in testing source code. You cannot do it in the Java file or Perl or Python file. You'll have to define a separate XML file to do that. But it is represented by one XML file. As the suite is the feature of execution, it also allows flexible configuration of the tests to be run. So what I do is I just create an XML file and tell it, okay, I want to execute a suite whose name is XYZ and it should contain all these test classes. So once you say that, okay, you want to run it over all these test classes, it will grab all the at the rate test annotations provided by test ng and calculate. Okay, there are 10 test cases that can be executed from three different classes. So it will start execution of these classes either one by one or in parallel. A suite can contain one or more tests and is defined by the suite tag. So the tag that is XML tag used is suite. What does the suite allow? It allows execution of multiple test cases from multiple classes. So you can define test cases from multiple classes to be executed in one go. It allows parallel execution. So you can execute your test cases in parallel and allows execution of test cases in groups where single test can belong to multiple groups. So you can also create a group of test cases with the help of group parameter in testng. So if your one test case, it needs to belong to different groups that is also possible. You can just execute one of the group and all the test cases that have the group name will get executed one after another or in parallel. Okay, the next question is what is parameterization in test ng and how to pass parameters using test ng.xml file. So we learned just now that okay test ng.xml file can be used for you know execution of different test cases. So first of all let's talk about parameterization. TestNG allows to define parameters in testng.xml file and then reference those parameters in test cases. So for instance, I want to execute my test case on a certain environment and the username and the password for each of the environment is different. So whenever I say, okay, I want to execute it on staging environment, I need to say the value of username and password. But this username and password is used in all the test cases. I have 100 test cases and you know 100 test cases are going to perform the login operation so it's not possible to go to 100 places and change that username and password. So what I select to do is I select that whatever environment I choose I'll be passing the username and password through the testng.xml file. So I can define a parameter as username and password in my testng.xml file 
and accept this parameter in my test cases. So my test cases would look something like this. So for instance, I have public class parameterized test. So at the rate test, this is the test annotation. Inside the test annotation, I have at the rate parameter annotation. I am accepting parameter called as my value. And once this parameter is available over here, I need to import it to the public void method associated with the test case. So what I do is public void parameter test string my name. So the parameter has come as my name. So I'm just passing it on to the test method. And now it is available within the test method for performing any kind of operation. So if you try just simple sys out over here, so you would get the value whatever I have passed from the test ng.xml file. Okay, so how does the test ng.xml file look like when there's a parameter that needs to be sent? So first of all, you have the suite name that is the custom suite, test name as the custom test. Then you define a parameter tag. So this is a tag, XML tag. The name of the parameter is my name and the value is John. So if you go to this particular example, what will happen is when I run the test ng.xml file, it will pass on John to this parameter. So the value of my name is John. The same value gets passed to parameter test as a string. So it says, okay, string my name, which has value as John now. And when it comes to sysout, the parameter value is John will be printed on your console. So this is how it works. So it's passing the value from the XML file to the parameter annotation. And from parameter annotation, you need to import it in the test method. And once you have imported it, it can be utilized within the test method as many number of times as required. So if I have 100 test cases, I will just be importing the parameter over there and then I can use the parameter in each of the test case. I don't need to go and change it. I can change it in testng.xml and work with it. Next question, explain data providers in testng using an example. Can I call a single data provider method for multiple functions and classes? So just now we saw that test ng supports parameters. That is, I can pass a value from my test ng file to my method, test method, and I can easily work with it. What is the requirement for a data provider? So first of all, let's clear with the definition of data provider. Data providers are used to pass complex parameters or parameters that need to be created from Java. That is complex objects, objects read from property file or databases. So basically data providers are used in case of objects. Objects can come from anywhere. It can be a created object. It can be a parameterized object coming from the complex Java objects or it can be from a property file or from a database as well. So basically it's an object. This is one thing that we understood. It's a parameter, but the value of this parameter will be an object. At the rate data provider marks a method as supplying data for a test method. So whenever you mark this annotation to a method that is at the rate data provider, so then it tells, okay, this method will be supplying data for different test method. The annotated method must return an object where each object can be assigned to parameter list of the test method. So here what it is returning is an object. So this object, it can be assigned to parameter list of the test method. I have that object, I can pass on that object and there is a list of parameters in the test method. So one by one, these you know values from the object, they get assigned to the parameters in the test method. At the rate test method, that wants to receive data from this data provider needs to use data provider name equal to the name of this annotation. So whatever is the name of this annotation and the method wants to receive data from the data provider, it will have to use the same name as the name of the data provider. The second part of the question, can I call a single data provider method for multiple functions and classes? So I just have one data provider and can I call it from multiple classes and multiple functions? The answer is yes. Same data provider can be used in multiple functions and classes by declaring data provider in separate class and reusing it in multiple classes. So what you can do is you need to create a separate class and you need to define data provider in that class. Then when you want to use it in different methods, just create an object of the data provider class and access the value of the objects in data provider using the class object. So this is how you can access objects of data provider 
in multiple classes at the same time. The next question is how to skip a method or a code block in test ng. So this is pretty simple. You have at the rate test annotation. So at the rate test annotation is going to accept a parameter called as enabled. And this enabled can have two values. The first one is enabled is equal to false. And that means the particular test case will not be executed. It will be skipped and at the rate test enabled is equal to true. That means the test will be executed. So this parameter does not need to be specified explicitly. If you don't specify it, what test ng assumes it that this test is enabled is equal to true. That means it will execute the test case even if this parameter is not present. But if you state explicitly that enabled is equal to false, that means you want test ng to skip that test. Okay, the next one. What is soft assertion in Selenium? So you must have heard this term that you should be using soft assertions when you have multiple assertion points in your test case so that you know your test can continue till any kind of exception is thrown. So let's talk about what exactly are soft assertions. Soft assertions are customized error handler provided by test ng. So Soft assertions, there is a class associated with soft assertions and you can create different objects of soft assertions and use it within your code to assert the value of any kind of object under test. Soft assertion do not throw exceptions when assertion fails and continue it next step. So this is very important to understand that soft assertion is not going to throw any kind of exception even if the assertion fails. So against the hard assertions or the assertions provided by the assert class, assert class what it will do is if any of the assertion fails, it will throw out an exception and exception won't allow your test case to proceed further. But with soft assertion, you can still, even if your assertion fails, you can still go on to the next step and check if the next assertion passes or fails. If hard assertion is in place, then your test case ultimately fails because the hard assertion has failed. Okay, but if you have soft assertions and you know all the soft assertion fail and your last hard assertion it passes then the test case will be declared as pass it won't fail because there was no exception being thrown by the soft assertions. So basically the use is for multiple assertions. Now let's have a look at the second question. The second question says how can you mark a test case as failed by using soft assertion. So though I'm using soft assertion, what I want to do is I want to mark a test case fail if any of my assertions are failing. So what can be the purpose of this? So I have four assertions in my test, assertion A, assertion B, C and D. So my assertion A, it fails. My assertion B passes after which again some steps are performed. Then it comes to assertion C which passes again, then some steps are performed and then assertion D fails again. So my soft assertions allowed my test to execute completely instead of stopping it at the first point that is at assertion A because assertion A failed. So I wouldn't have ever executed the rest of the steps and known whether the rest of the things they are in good shape or they are in bad shape. So you can put multiple soft assertions and also ask the test case to fail if the assertions have failed. So how to do that? For that you need to make a call to assert all method. So assert all method what it will do is it will get combined results from assertion A, B, C and D. And if any of the soft assertions has failed then call to assert all method will throw an exception. So once the exception is thrown your test case fails. Right? Though there are two assertions that have passed but still because of the two assertion your test case will be failing. So this is how you can use soft assertions in Selenium. Moving on to next question. How does test ng allow you to state dependencies? Explain with an example. So test ng has a feature that you can state a dependency on a test case for execution of the next test. So for instance, I want to perform some operations with my application but that's not possible without logging in to the application. So I can state a dependency on a test method which is used for login to the application. So what does this dependency does? Let's take an example first. So 
you have three test cases. The first test method is accelerate, then you have change gear and the drive method. So the accelerate method, it has a dependency on the change gear method. So unless and until change gear method is executed, accelerate cannot be executed. So it goes to change gear and sees, does change gear has some kind of dependency? Yes, change gear has a dependency on the drive method. So it goes to the drive method and then it first checks again that is there a dependency on any other method? No. So it will execute drive method first, then the change gear method and then the accelerate method. So it basically checks if any kind of dependent test case is yet to be executed, the dependent test case will get executed first. So dependency is a feature in test ng that allows a test method to depend on a single or a group of test methods. Not only single test method, you can also state multiple test methods to depend on. Method dependency works fine if the depend on method is a part of the same class or any of the inherited base classes. So you need to keep one thing in mind that whatever method you want to depend on should be in the same class or any of the inherited classes. So how is the dependency stated? It is stated as a attribute or as a parameter with at the rate test annotation. So at the rate test depends on methods is equal to, for instance, init environment test. I can not only provide one test method over here, but I can provide multiple test methods over here. So please make a note that this init environment test is the name of the test method on which it is depending. So as we saw this example over here, I have accelerate, change gear, drive. So the dependency for accelerate states that it depends on change gear, which is the name of the method. I go over here, I see, okay, change gear method. Is it dependent? Yes, it's dependent on drive. So drive, change gear, and then accelerate. Explain what is group test in test ng. So test ng provides you a feature that the same test case can be a part of multiple groups. So if I want to execute a particular group, then all the test cases which have that particular group name will get executed in the particular suite. So for instance, I have multiple test cases like on max speed, drive, accelerate and drifting. So all of these, they belong to certain groups. So the first method that is on max speed is a member of group bike. Second test method that is drive is a member of group car and bike. Third test method that is accelerate is a member of car and bike again. And the fourth test method that is drifting is a member of car, bike and Audi group. So these are the three groups that have been listed. So what happens if I execute group bike? So if I execute group bike, the test method on max speed, drive, accelerate, and drifting will get executed. If I execute group car, then if you see on max speed doesn't have group car, so on max speed won't be executed. Drive will be executed because it is a part of group car. Accelerate will be executed and drifting will be executed. But if I select to execute group Audi, then there is only one test case that belongs to this group that is drifting and drifting will get executed. So this is how you can state groups. Now for instance, how does it relate to the project scenarios? So you have test cases, some of which are a part of different groups like smoke test, sanity test and release test. That is for a particular release you want it. So these are the three groups that I have. So there can be few test cases which are common in all three groups few test cases common to two groups and few test cases which belong to only one group. For instance, the release sanity test cases. So sanity test case can be a part of smoke test as well. It can be the part of release test as well, the same test case. So I can provide these group names and when I execute a suite with group name as sanity, so only test cases which are included in the group sanity will get executed. Smoke test case, same case, that is there might be, you know, few test cases which I want that whenever there is a new build, I want to execute the smoke test cases. So only test case which have smoke test as the group will get executed in this particular scenario. Next question, what are the different types of framework which files can be used as data source for different frameworks? 
So this is a very project specific question wherein the interviewer will ask you to explain your project structure. So first of all, going to the first question, what are the different types of framework? So you have data driven frameworks, keyword driven frameworks and hybrid frameworks. So hybrid framework is a combination of keyword driven and data driven framework. So basically you have three types of framework and your application might demand a data driven framework if you have same functional flows and different data sets. It can demand a keyword driven framework wherein there are less technical people in your test teams and you want to enable them for execution of automated test cases. So then in the keyword driven framework would come into picture where your test cases they are written with the help of keywords and any tester who has the knowledge of functional flow will be able to arrange the keywords as per the functional flow and execute a test case. And the hybrid framework it is more of balance that is it has keyword driven architecture it has a data driven architecture. Your same test case, uh, your functional flow can be executed over different data sets. You have standalone functional flows and many more. So which files can be used as data source for different frameworks? So if you talk about what are different files, so you can use the Excel files, you can use XML files, CSV files, text files, etc. for providing data to your framework. The most popular being the Excel file. The Excel files are popular because it is very easy to edit the Excel files, easy to read and understand what you are actually doing with the help of Excel file because it shows you in rows and column combination. So this row and column combination will give you the exact picture of how and what is to be done with your application. That is what kind of tests are to be performed on your application. What is the data that is to be provided. If your data set is changing with every release then it's very economic way to use an Excel file so that it can be very easily changed. Okay, so let us talk about different components of framework. So this is a generic structure of all the frameworks that is may it be data driven, may it be keyword driven. All these components they come together to serve the purpose of a framework. How you use them will define whether it's data driven, whether it's keyword driven, whether it's hybrid. So let us talk with respect to this diagram that is the first layer that is the external layer which is accessible to each and every member of your team will be the test management tool. So in the test management tool you can define what test cases need to be executed. You can collect the pass and fail status of the test cases and so on. Then comes your automation tool. There are so many automation tools available in market that is you have Selenium, you have QDP, you have IBM RFT that stands for IBM Rational Functional Tester, you have Silk Test and many more. So you can choose an automation tool that caters to your requirements. But so far Selenium outstands the benefits of all the testing tools and has minimum drawbacks of any test tools. So Selenium is the most popular testing tool, automation tool used in industry worldwide today. Then you have a framework logical layer. So framework logical layer, it is going to, it's kind of abstraction. For the outer world, it's not going to show the implementation details of what is being coded to any kind of non-technical testers. What it is going to show is, okay, you want to execute this, this is how you should do it. That is for a keyword driven framework. What are the methods and what do they do? What is written inside the methods, what is written inside the library files, the non-technical tester might not require to know that. He knows, okay, if the keyword is login, so internally it is going to a method that will enter the username, enter the password, he's not concerned with that. He knows that, okay, he wants to log into the application. So he just states, okay, login. So framework logical layer is going to hide all the implementation details. So inside the framework logical layer, there are certain components of your framework. The first one being the driver script. So driver script is where you keep a record of what test cases needs to be executed in this particular cycle. That is if I start to run my test cases, then I have 800 test cases, but I don't need to execute all of them. I just need 50 test cases to be executed. So I can state in the driver script what test cases are to be executed. So driver script will you know, keep a record of everything. And what it is capable of doing, driver script is capable of calling all these test methods. 
then you have the automation script whatever language whatever tool you use your automation script is basically a test case a functional flow of your application so it requires multiple things for each of the automation tests to get executed it requires a repository it requires some kind of data it requires variables so all of them are communicated to the automation script via the framework logical layer so let's talk about the object repository as we just talked about the page object model so page object model also has an object repository what is that that's the collection of objects that I'll be using throughout the test script execution so object repository is going to keep all the objects and provide it to the scripts as and when required it's a central location because of which if there's a change in object I don't need to go to multiple places to change that object I can change the object at one place and each and every automation script that demands for the particular object will get the updated object then you have the database layer so database layer is something from where your data comes so it can be global variables it can be test data so test data it can be stored in different types of file that is data files excel files csv files and so on and your global variables they can be stored in configuration files they can be stored as environment variables so all these variables and database layer will take care so that they are provided to your script as and when required so whichever component demands something from another component the framework logical layer will take care to provide that particular data or variable to the demanding component then coming back to the automation tool layer we have a reporting layer so reporting is very important because that gives non-technical users or the stakeholders an insight of what exactly is happening with the application are we on the right path are we not on the right path so everything is provided by the reports so reports they need to be descriptive they need to be pictorial or you can say graphical so that if I draw a pie chart of number of test cases executed pass fail and error so it's more readable for the business users for the stakeholders that okay I can see there are 100 test cases 98 passed one failed one error so now they are happy about the report that I have 98 percent of my test cases passing they can come to the technical team and ask okay what is the reason of these two failures what happened what went wrong what is the error and so on but instead of going through the line by line report seeing okay pass fail pass fail the pictorial representation gives them a better idea in a less amount of time so what are the different reports that can be generated the first is the test reports so we were talking about the test reports only that okay there are graphs there are excel sheets which maintain a status for each run okay why are reports important let's talk about that as well so reports are important because whatever number of iterations you perform testing it's going to keep the record of pass and fail test cases each time it would have been very difficult if I run you know my test suite two times in a week with hundred test cases and you want a tester to manually put in which pass and which fail that doesn't make point first of all and the second part is it's a tedious repetitive task so instead of keeping this for the manual intervention if they are automated each time a report is generated it is automatically populated which can be distributed across the test teams development teams and stakeholders as well to the upper management as well the next type is error logs so any kind of errors arising in the application they need to have a particular description okay what went wrong when it went wrong and what was the error being thrown by the application all these three things will help debugging and because of which you will be able to reach to the source of the problem really early and save a lot of time for your teams then the defect reports so whatever deviations you find from the expected behavior of the application will be logged as defects so you can keep a track of defects which will help you to maintain during each release cycle what was the number of defects how did you uh, you know like number of defects is it going higher is it coming down is the application stable this insight can be generated from the defect reports and the last one is exception email notification so exception email notification it is a part of your framework because most of the times what you will like to do is 
while you are still working with your machine, you would like to trigger the execution of automated test cases on a remote machine. So for instance, it takes four hours for your automated test scripts to execute, your suite to get executed. So there was an error after the first hour and you never checked the machine because you expected it to go on for four hours and after four hours you come to know okay you have wasted last three hours because you did not have a look at the machine and there was an exception being generated. So to avoid these situations an email notification should be triggered to the respective team members and stakeholders whenever there is an exception that arises in the application. So what will happen is with the email notification the user will come in and investigate okay what was the cause of exception is it a blocker should we move on to the next test cases or what should we do so all these things become time saving and they allow you to execute your test cases in one go okay guys so these were the important interview questions we have covered and if you have any more questions we are welcome you can always Ask us any interview questions, any tricky questions that you have come across and we will be happy to answer them. So course details and customer reviews. So Edureka has a live online classes for testing with Selenium WebDriver as well as many other topics. So please do visit edureka.co for the course details wherein we have the detailed description of the course content which we cover. We have very interactive classes wherein the participants can pour in questions and instructors will answer them so that there is no bridge and no gap between the understanding of the participants and the teaching of the instructor. For some reviews that people who have taken our courses, you can visit www.edureka.co slash testing hyphen with hyphen selenium hyphen web driver. So, they are really satisfied people with the testing with Selenium web driver course from Edureka. So that's all from our end. For any questions, you can always write us by visiting www.edureka.co. Thank you and wish you all the best. I hope you enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply to them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to our Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning.